I think we are we are getting we are getting there. Okay. Uh, so, Victoria, there are going to be uh, various kinds of audience. Some people you're going to see, some people on Zoom, but you don't see some people on YouTube, whatever. So I'll be, you know, narrating questions if they come from people who are invisible to you. Okay. Um, but I say let's get started. Um, it's a great pleasure to have Victoria Vashina um, in spirit with us today. Uh, Victoria is a truly splendid uh, macro finance economist that I uh, really admire, and we've been looking to have her here for a very long time. And this, of course, doesn't count, uh, but at least we get to learn about her research, uh, which is better than nothing. But at some point, we'll have her here uh, as a corporeal being. Um, and um, in Turkish, we're very fond of saying the timing is conspicuous. Uh, the timing is conspicuous, uh, given what has been happening in Turkey these days. Uh, dollar debt uh, and the Peruvian experience are uh, very dear to us. So, floor is yours. Why don't you go ahead? All right. Well, thank you for having me. And, Rafid, thank you for such generous introduction. So, this is joint work with Brian Gutierrez. He He's a... a it starting PhD student actually, and he was at Supervencia de Banca, which is a regulatory agency in Peru, and Juliana Salamao, who is at University of Minnesota. All right. So the question uh, will be, uh, why is it that uh, borrowing in dollars is such a salient feature of emerging economies? Of course, dominance of the dollar lending worldwide is also important. But as you will see here, we do think that there is an emerging market component to it. And, uh, and I, we don't think that in the broader debate about a, trying, in the broader literature, trying to tackle the dominance of the dollar in, uh, as, as a current choice of currency for different economic reasons, including the borrowing, we don't think that the emerging markets was isolated sufficiently. And, and, uh, and you will see also uh, what do we have more broad, how do we, uh, we contribute to the literature more broadly. This is probably an audience for which I don't have to motivate as to why the dollar borrowing and emerging market is a particular, particularly important uh, subject. And, uh, and of course, if you take many crises, emerging market crises, even if they are not initiated by the, uh, by the balance sheet, uh, effects balance sheet mismatch, that is oftentimes in, in, an important propagation mechanism in understanding just the general dynamic of, of, of the evolution of the crisis. And so with that, uh, it makes it, if anything, I mean, first of all, it's important. Second is that it makes it extra puzzling as to why is it that despite this lessons that we experience again and again in history, the economies have such hard time moving away from the dollar. Now, if you go on the ground, uh, if you actually I had the pleasure to, to talk to a few uh, a market players in, in, in Turkey as well, and if you just start asking, uh, why would they borrow in dollars for businesses that are generating uh, revenues in local currency? The answer often emerges that it is cheap. And actually, this is also consistent with the broader survey, uh, some of the surveys that were that are out there that are trying to explore the same topic. Now, in my case, actually, I interact with folks who do private equity. So these are very sophisticated people. And, uh, and so it can previously, even though this idea of the cheapness might have not strike, been striking to you that the borrowers think that it's cheap, we might have dismissed it by saying, well, they're just kind of miscalculating it, if at all understanding the fact that it should be cheaper just because of the, of the uh, exchange rate depreciation, right? Uh, however, in this context, with the sophisticated players, it's very unlikely. And so that's what kind of led to thinking about, can we pin it down? Can we pin it down in the data? Now, this will be a little bit challenging because generally, you need a very, very accurate data. And I will show you uh, in a second what is it that we have. But basically, you have loan need to have like information on the loan level to pin it down unambiguously. And, uh, and that is actually constrained. 
because most of the standard data sources don't have it. All in all, for mm -hmm. we found this data after much exploring in the Peruvian context. I will speak about what is why does it exist in that context. And we are able to pin down for Peru that through the time period that we look at, uh, uh, that indeed borrowing in dollars accounting for the exchange rate, expected exchange rate depreciation uh, is about 2% per year cheaper. Now, the two in itself is, I cannot make meaning out of the number two, but what is important for me is uh, to highlight for you that it's huge, right? So if you have an opportunity to, like it's a real decision, if as a company I'm borrowing, and then there is a 2% difference that's staring at me, accounting for the UIP, that is a significant, uh, something that's significantly gonna uh, impact my, my decision of how to borrow. Now, this is a, the first part of the paper will be all about measuring and trying to convince you that this is two is just sitting there accounting for anything that we can think of as economists as to why there should be differential. So there will be the two percent discount that this cannot be explained by the standard approach. And so there we tied up with the fact, what's well known fact that in emerging markets, people prefer to save in dollars. And so it all starts, and so we take that, that idea of, of uh, heavy dollarization of deposits and we are gonna try to tie up the two sides. And what emerges from our work is that there seems to be, this is the dynamic of it is uh, not so much driven by the borrowers. And surely there is some desire of risk taking as well as there is some role to the banks of it. But the biggest piece of the puzzle comes of, out of the way the savings, savings works and therefore the deposit composition work, which is pushes it through the system towards the borrowers. And that's, that we think that's the right, correct way to think about, uh, it, about what, what might be driving the end result of heavy dollarization of deposits, of, 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 of the borrowing, and therefore an exposure on the balance sheet. So this is in a nutshell where we're gonna go. First chunk will be measurement, strictly measurement. Second chunk, trying to make sense of where is it coming from. And Rafit, I can see your hand. Um, so something that you're going to like, uh, I'll take a minute to inject a Turkish bit into this. Uh, anyone in this audience would tell you the same things, but um, yeah, it's not going to surprise you that we live through the same things with some regulatory differences that will, um, that will support the points that you are going to make. In that, um, you know, after that huge 2001 debacle, we had a great new banking law that not only prohibited banks from borrowing in foreign currency and lending in liras, but also prohibited, and I think this was very uh, prescient, um, borrowing in foreign currency and lending in foreign currency unless the borrower had foreign currency receivables. Mm -hmm. So it didn't allow the banks to convert foreign currency risk into credit risk, right? Um, until 2009. In 2009, uh, during the thick of the global financial crisis, the government just so wanted you know, firms to borrow and do something, they rescinded this clause so that any firm could borrow in foreign currency. And at the time, of course, you know, uh, given inflation, the lira uh, debt was about you know, 8 to 10 percent in Turkey. Um, right? you know, foreign interest rates were zero. Uh, Turkish banks were borrowing at 2 3 percent, lending at 5 6 percent, and the lira was appreciating. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Turkish real side firms, foreign currency bank borrowing went through the roof. You can see the structural break in the series that the moment they were allowed, they were doing this. The interesting question is when they were not allowed to do this, what the banks were doing with all this foreign currency deposits. Mm -hmm. uh, and the answer turns out to be cross currency swaps. Oh. Right. Uh, so there was this huge market in London where uh, the Goldmans of the world had realized that they are able to borrow in Turkish liras at cheaper interest rates than the Turkish government. And so they used to issue Turkish lira debt and swap it with Turkish banks against foreign currency that they were holding and had no use for. Mm -hmm. So there you have it. So in many, so, so there is an interesting question, which is what, 
what is the right policy response here? And of course, Peru will not, and so, so the settings that you described that was working in Turkey, something very similar, of course, was implemented in Mexico and Brazil, right? And it's it's a, an extreme measure, right? Where you just kind of prohibit them to, uh, because of course your problem is that you still have all the, exactly. it's not on, you can match the buying balance sheet, but the problem is that then the firms are sitting on the mismatch and that's ultimately going to feed into the, into the banking system as well. Uh, you will see what Peru is doing and you will see that they are, they are doing something something also aggressive. And yet, it's keeping keeping it, uh, I, it keeping the the lending very dollarized still. So so I cannot speak directly to like which policy tool is better, but you can see that uh, aggressive measures outside of this extreme extreme approach are uh, not particularly effective on it. Now uh, the. Uh, as a thing about cross currency swaps, this is an important point, and maybe uh, I'll, it's better if I comment about it later. But uh, the general swapping acti uh, activity here will be incredibly limited, and we actually able to also see all the derivatives transactions surrounding banks and borrowers, and uh, and it's first of all it's minimal. But even we can also kind of account for it. So, but it's an it's an important okay. point of if you can carry this cheapness outside of the country. I think that the way to think about Peru and we think that it's a representative way of thinking about an emerging market is that for the most part you are not able to just kind of through derivative or any other way to, to take these cheap deposits and dollars and carry them outside. Much of it lands in the economy and in form of lending. All right. So this is just, uh, of course, uh, I, re I, I really like the literature on the subject. It's not a very large literature, but it's a, I think that a lot of it is a very clever literature of trying to, to dissect this idea about why, why this mismatch exists, why, why firms or, or borrow and banks lend in, in dollars. And uh, some of this some of this I will uh, actually show you that it's it's there. It's just a matter of what is the driving force, right? For example, so, so we do not compete against any of these explanations. We just provide a separate observations that we believe is most important in emerging markets. And you will, I will specifically, for example, speak to the carry trade, which is more of like a risk taking risk taking channel. And there is some of it uh, on the borrower side, but the driving forces overall, and that's that's just an icing on on the cake in this problem. Okay, and of course some other clever explanations about dollar preferences and dollar specialness. Uh, they tend to be aggregate, right? They tend to be uh, universal. Like, for example, Gita Gopinas and Jeremy Stein uh, or Bacola Lorenzoni paper, uh, which is closest to us. That's both of those are theory papers. Uh, but they they think about it as a blanket. It should apply to all countries, not to only to emerging markets. All right. So here's a plan. And I'm going to start with the data. Then, as I said, we'll measure it precisely arrive to what does this mean when people say dollar debt is, cheap, is cheaper in the Peruvian context. And finally, we'll think about how to uh, reconcile it, where is it coming from. So the data is key. Of course, uh, the state of the art uh, in, uh, in, in the banking literature is to use micro data, right, to pin down to think about uh, issues as a uh, macro issues by looking as a traditional approach, of course, requires your credit rate, credit uh, registry data. Now, this is unfortunately most of the credit registry data, with the exception, I believe, the Turkish one, <laughs> don't include information on interest rates. And this is key to us, of course, to understand cheapness, right? So we need an interest rate on individual loan. Credit registry is something that tracks balances and it kind of doesn't track loans. It doesn't track the origination and therefore loan specific variables is not as the strength of the credit registry data over the world. We do have credit registry and there are good things that, emerge, that, that we can use from this data, but our core data source will be a 
precisely because Peruvian government is concerned with this heavy dollarization of the of the of the lending for the very reasons that you raised at the beginning. So they had this initiative where they uh, actually specifically started to collect interest rates. So it's just completely different set result of them just trying to be clever and thoughtful about and at least collecting the data. And that's exactly what we're going to have. So we have individual loans. We have them by currency. We observe the interest rate. Before I forget, it might be useful to understand that most of the foreign lending in Peru is in dollars. So it's really about local currency versus dollars. So there is not much action in any other foreign currency going on. All right. So 2012 through 2018, it's not for full universe, but it's rather a representative set of firms which they collected this interest information. And as you can see, we will combine it with some other data sets, including the, the, uh, the information on, um, from tax authority. All right. So here I'm just showing to you the very basic descriptive statistics. Nothing, no, no control, nothing. I'm just looking at the loans in local currency, which is solids and I'm looking at the loans in dollars, right? And so the very first line kind of starts speaking to you as to what's going on. Of course, we will have to adjust for, uh, for the expected depreciation, right? Exchange rate depreciation. And so you can see that in interest rates, there's immediately gap. Now, if you're concerned that somehow foreign banks are different from domestic banks, that's, that actually, we do quite a bit in the paper to just being very transparent about foreign banks versus local banks, and the dynamic will be incredibly similar. The other thing is that all of our analysis will be within bank. Like, so we are comparing loans in different currencies within a given bank, within a given industry. So really, that comparison is irrelevant, but it might be interesting for you to know that the same pattern manifests itself for large banks and for small banks. So that's, that's how to say. May I ask a quick question? Of course. Is this, um, when you said 50 to 55%, is it 50% of all commercial loans or is it 50% of all loans, including uh, loans to households? E, there is no ho households in here. Okay. This is so, st strictly uh, commercial loans. Okay, so the universe is commercial. Okay, thank yes. you. Yeah. As in like credit standard credit registries, that's commercial loans, right? All right. And you can also see that firm on firm characteristic where we can observe uh, this, this it, an important point that those firms that are borrowing in local currency versus those companies that are borrowing in, do, in dollars, they are very similar uh, uh, in terms of uh, they are the characteristics that we get to see. Okay. So difference in rate, Lots of similarity on what we see. So let's, let's get to the 2%. So this is, I, I believe this is somewhat established uh, in the literature, that because a person who is less familiar with the subject might say, and, and I do get this reaction quite a bit when I present this, is that the first explanation that this is just all mismeasured. That this dollarization sign of credit is really hiding the fact that the firms are borrowing dollars as exporters, and it all makes sense because they're gonna generate revenues in dollars, and and the firms, and so it kind of the problem is not so big, right? And it's a fair concern. I think, as I said, I think that for those who uh, dug into this problem, I think that we are convinced that this is a bigger problem, which isn't very much in line with the fact that it is a part of explanation of propagation of the major crisis that we've seen. But nevertheless, I do think that we have, like, let's establish it. And I do think that we have a nice little take to add on this front as well. So the first graph, the one that splits it in two. So because we have such granular data, we can just nail this point and put it to rest. To what degree the dollarization is really problem, right? So in first graph, I'm just sorting them in exporters and not exporters. Eh, rough measure, but much better than just speaking, guessing it in aggregate. And the key takeaway here is the bottom one, right? So to the degree that you believe that exporters are somehow perfectly matched in terms of currency and their balance sheet, you can see that the problem is that non-exporters are heavily borrowing in dollars as well. You can do better than that. And so actually that 
after collecting the in the the proven regulator being concerned with the fact that okay they force banks to be matched something that i'll show you shortly but they're fully aware that the problem just moved into the balance sheet of the borrowers right and so they actually collected data and finally implemented a capital requirement for exposure on the borrower's balance sheet. So every bank has to classify over the period that we are looking, 2012 to 2008, has to classify their borrowers in whether they are exposed or very exposed to the dollar, to, the, to, to effects mismatch on the borrower's balance sheet. Now, the exact procedure is a black box, but we know actually a couple of things about it. I mean, first of all, we know what is the goal. The goal is to catch exposure on the borrower balance sheet. Importantly for us, it does two things. Export and non-exporters, that's very rough. We don't really know composition of the revenues by currency. So the variable that has overexposed actually has precise composition of revenues by currency. So the borrower reports to the bank's composition of revenues by currency. And based on this procedure, that will be one of the factors that is, is accounted for. The other thing is that it's net of any hedging. And of course, on the left, you could have said, well, but we don't know if they hedge or not hedge. On the right, we know that they're, whether they hedge or not hedge. So, both, so it's more granular, and it also has this financial leg to it, which is nice. And so what we do now is by putting it to you by industry, because some of them like fishing and mining, of course, exporters. But you can see that there are many sectors where, first of all, there is across all sectors there are exposed firms, right? And in significant quantities. And you can see that in non, non-exporting industries, there is quite a bit of exposure. That's the point of this. All right, so the exposure is there, it's real, and we can, we can assert it very clearly here. This graph is a takeaway from, is, is, is non-parametric in any way. This is just interest rates plotted, but this is primarily the takeaway that we, we kind of come, uh, we're gonna see in the data now very granularly. But what do we see? So there are three things plotted, right? They are all differences. They are differences between local currency and the foreign currency. So for example, Dollar borrowing premium. This is a two percent on average. So the very the top line, the, the black line. This is what the what it looks on the lending side. The the, the differences not adjusted for anything. Is that just the difference plotted over time? Now the question is, can how how what what else is going on in the economy to understand? And you can see that the second point is that that differential present in the lending is incredibly closely tracked from by the differentials that you observe on the deposit side. So that's point number one. So we have the 2% and that 2%. Wait, 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 wait. Can you define what the deposit premium is? It's the difference between what and what? Uh, the interest rate on the uh, paid on the local currency and and dollar and dollars. So this saying that the, what you pay on dollars is cheaper. OK. And then we have the central bank, and you can see that that one has nothing to do with it, basically. And by but, the way, but, but again, can you tell me what the central bank dollar premium is? What is it? it it's, it's a different thing. What? It's issuing in dollars versus issuing in local currencies. The differential in the cost. I'm well, confused. The central, the Peruvian central bank does not issue in dollars. I'm fairly sure. Correct. And you, and this is like a caveat of this aggregate graph. In the data, we'll be able to do uh, to do a little bit better. But here is uh, U.S. minus. Uh, uh, so the cost of the U.S. debt versus the cost of the uh, of the Peruvian debt. That's what that's what that part is. But this has nothing to do with central banks, right? This well, is this just a. This is the central bank. This is a, the equivalent to treasury. That's what I was thinking. It's the it's the treasury spread. Sure, 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 sure. It's okay, okay. So now I understand. I have another question before you go ahead on the uh, bank's classification of firms into exposed to effects and not exposed to effects. If there, if this is just based on uh, you know bankers' declaration that this firm is exposed, this one isn't. Mm -hmm. um, 
the incentives seem to be kind of not uh, very well uh, aligned here in that when I'm lending to a firm, I'd really like to announce them to be not very exposed to FX. Um, totally. Perfect. But keep in mind that this is a more, <laughs> so if you are, this is the most granular evidence you're going to have out there, right? To okay. best of my knowledge, there is no other study that gets close to possibly saying this is what the mismatch is at the borrower, borrower, borrower's level, right? So, so, so yes, you're absolutely right. There is some agency involved at the firm level and the lender level. Presumably, they're both going the other direction, right? So this is a okay. lower, lower bound on that entire thing, right? So, right. so, so, so if... Uh, so first, this is bias. So what you're saying, it biases these numbers down, and yet we observe exposure. That is of any significant magnitude. Second is that, okay, if you're going to think that this is irrelevant, then you're definitely in the denier camp of the dollar exposure as a relevant mechanism. <laughs> you're breaking my heart here, but I'll let you get away with it. All right, so look, I mean, from here, there is one, so this is just to give you a sense of where this is gonna go, uh, of, uh, of the fact that once you start adjusting for UIP, and this is just an aggregate, so we'll be able to do it much more granularly in a second, but you can see that this is not something that is gonna correct it or correct it in the right way. I think this graph is also useful for us to understand that, for example, if I task, uh, if, if I task somebody this, saying, let's calculate the UIP deviation in Peru or elsewhere. What will be the exercise that the person does? What I would do in those circumstances is that I would grab exactly those rates, right? So I would say, oh, this is what the premium is in dollars. I'm trying to understand uh, this is the discount in, in dollars for lending. And I'm trying to understand whether it's accounting by a, whether I can, uh, is this is explained by the uh, UIP. And so I would take the central bank rates, which is what, what all most of the studies do. And then I would just kind of combine those. And this picture tells to me that I'm looking at the wrong UIP when I use, try to understand a phenomenon of dollarization of credit. And I'm using the UIP constructed in a standard way from central banks. That picture tells me that's not the relevant UIP. And that's a deposit UIP will be different from the ones that we can imply from the central banks. So that's kind of an important observation for this basic exercise that we often do of trying to understand the UIP violation. All right, we're gonna take the rates. The left-hand variable is just loan interest rate. So if it's a, whatever being charged on the, on the dollar, dollar loan and whatever is being charged on the local currency. The very first column basically dummies out the ones that are in dollars. This is the difference between the previous graph and this one is that now I'm including firm fixed effects, right? So if a firm has one loan in the sample that's taken out, it has to have several loans and, and that's, that basically captures firm constant characteristics through time. I'm also including bank quarter fixed effects throughout, everything I have to show you here will be throwing out any heterogeneity across banks, just in case. But also we can be extra transparent by showing you how foreign banks behave. All right, so the first, so you see how I took the previous, just the line that I showed you, and now I'm just try, starting, starting to rule out any, any kind of heterogeneity patterns that might be had, hiding behind it because my granular data can allow for it. Also not reported here, but you can see they are listed that I'm also, we have loan controls such as loan size, loan maturity, whether it's collateralized. Uh, I also have some firm characteristic, whether it's a small corporate firm, it's a dummy. What is the age of the firm? What is the bank rating of the firm? So there are a couple of additional characteristics that are time varying and therefore not taking out by the firm fixed effect, right? If I just plug in the dummy, that takes care of things like industry, but, but it doesn't take uh, care of the, of the time varying characteristic. So the first three columns just kind of play with different firm fixed effects, right? Oh, the, not firm, different fixed effects. So this is just a set of dummies and I'm just demeaning the sample by the given characteristic. I'm saying to you, to the degree that there are difference between large and small banks, which there is not frankly in the data, 
But to the degrees that there is, just gonna throw it out. I'm gonna demean it, right? To the degrees that there is differences across industries, but I'm gonna go more granular to that. Industry quarter, I'm gonna take that thing out. So it really becomes a comparison across two loans to the same firm, one in the, uh, not to the same firm, to the firm in a given, uh, in a given industry, in a given quarter, within a given bank, and I'm just comparing dollar loans versus versus uh, a local currency loans. And that basically is a 2% that survives. No adjustment for expectation in, uh, in uh, exchange rate yet. Uh, we'll do that in a second. Let's look at the last two columns. In the last two columns, I wanna look at these two things that I introduced with that graph. One is the exporter, and the other one is exposed variable, right? So first, uh, I'm gonna look at the exposed. And I wanna see that whether this basically interest rate somehow being charged to effectively non, primarily to non-exposed. Now, you can see that when I plug in this exposed and exposed interacted with dollar, yeah, there is some bite in the right direction. The exposed ones get lesser discount on the dollar loans as they should. But you can see that it doesn't put the dent on the first line, which is the main line that we are measuring. Let's go to exporters. The opposite should be true, by the way, right? So the exporters are the ones that are less exposed, they should get uh, cheaper dollar loans. And they do, again, you can see that from that interaction term of dollar loan to exporters. But again, the order of magnitude of that number is just not comparable to the first ones that we are measuring. Now let's do the real stuff. So we need to adjust this for UIT, right? So uh, at the moment I was plugging in the interest rate on the left-hand side and just trying to pick up this 2% very neatly. Well, I cannot do that because of course the uh, two rates should be different. And this is the way in which they should be different. So I'm looking at UIP. I mean, there is the usual stuff, but there is also the maturity element, which is super important. I have, and this is, I think, I mean, we, we are not exactly precise, but we are very granular in the way we can able to match the maturity of the expectations in the uh, dollar appreciation to the, uh, to the uh, maturity of the loan. We're kind of proud of that. So if it's a local currency loan, the rate stays as it is. If it's a dollar loan, I'm gonna modify my left-hand side variable to be what it should be given that, that there is a UIP violation. Okay. Or given that there is UIP. There is a little bit, for those of you who worked in the area, there is a question about which data we, we should be using for generating this expectation and dollar appreciation. That's the devil is in the detail here. And we, we can do two things. At the end of the day, we uh, converge to the, uh, to uh, using data from consensus forecast, uh, which appears to be the most accurate data that is out there. Um, now we also, because we observe all the derivative activity, we can imply the expectation and exchange rate from there. Um, that's why we started and then it was moved to the appendix, but either one you use is not relevant. The results that I'm showing you are using the consensus forecast for uh, for the expectation in exchange rate. The inability to match, we are constrained really by this expectations data uh, in terms of how granular we can match to the maturity. So it obviously doesn't come at incredibly low low granularity. And so that's, that's where it comes. I have a question. Um, so I have two ways of thinking of this. One is, you're a bank that has a boatload of dollar deposits for you know whatever reason you know people use this as a hedge whatnot um, right and, uh, and and you're stuck and therefore uh, you know you have to you have to lend this and essentially I'm benefiting from the fact that you are stuck um, it's it, it, in, in the sense you know I do borrow I'm happy that I'm I am uh, profiting off of your uh, lousy liability side versus you know, there is something like, uh, um, you know, peso problem here, 
that, uh, you know, if the currency suddenly blows up, uh, I'm going to be the one who's going to suck up the loss. And that, that, that skewness gets priced in, right? And that's not going to show up in the expected first moment. It's, it's, it's really the upside risk uh, that, you know, in the bad state of the world, uh, you know, my business will be bad, but also the soul will be devalued or, you know, it's going to depreciate like crazy against the dollar. And I'll be holding this, you know, huge debts that I have to deliver on. And so uh, it, this is actually a just price, so to speak. Um, so if it, in, next slide, I will actually have an extra column where I'm going to incorporate the volatility of expectations. There was an additional point uh, which you had, uh, and that is what role banks play in this, in this, in this entire pass 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 mechanism from the deposits to, to the loans. And in your example earlier, for example, you said, well, the Turkish banks were getting all those dollar uh, deposits. They go and they get to London and do things with it. Uh, and so and it, it is a very appealing proposition. If people are desperate to self save in deposits and they are willing to be underpaid for that by international standard, what an amazing source of cheap dollars that is. You can go and invest it elsewhere, but actually the banks will be constrained from doing so. And I, I will I will get back to that point in a second. Okay. Let, me, let me show you to, to your very good point about the, the expectations in depreciation. So first of all, uh, I hope this is clear. So we've modified, the, we adjusted the dollar rate. So same exercise, left-hand side variable is the interest rate. The first five column exactly as before is a difference that now the dollar rate is adjusted for UIP. The column number six is what Traffic is referring to, where we have the standard deviation of the expected, it, it mislabeled, it should say that it's expected effects. Where do we get it? Because that, that's the trick, of course, that it, it, measuring that is also a challenge. So that is not reported in consensus forecast, also there is some heterogeneity. Uh, what we use is that we actually use derivative contracts and we use information in, in the dispersion of the, of the exchange rate implied in those contracts uh, to adjust for that. So this is a very valid point. And the column six is the one where we try to deal with the fact that it's not only about uh, the first, first moment, there is a second moment, right? Now, um, I don't know if you have suggestions of, I mean, so, so this is about the closest we can get to the special problem. We do think that we have this nice data that allows us to back out expectations, like uncertainty about the exchange rate. Uh, but still, uh, I don't know if, uh, if there are any other common tricks for dealing, dealing with that. I don't have anything very deep to say, but um, I'd be interested in knowing uh, what happens ex post as well, right? These are the ex-ante measures of when I was borrowing, right? I thought I was borrowing 2% cheaper. Yeah. In the end, at least in sample, did it turn out to be cheaper for me? Yeah. So here's the absurd one. Let me show it to you. So this is uh, if we plugged in that realized as opposed to, uh, oops, and I, of course, I went out. So if you do it on the observed, that's the difference. Okay. So slightly different, but really order of magnitude, pretty much the same stuff. That's a good point and that we, we try to do that. Now, uh, so I'm done with as far as nailing down the 2%. <laughs> so the 2% is there, not explained by the UIP, not explained by the second moment. And it's this narrow, it's low level and this narrow set of effects that is what is relevant here. By the way, there is additional thing that I wanted to show you. Oh, by the way, this absurd one didn't redirect us to the correct table, by the way. Uh, and I didn't spot that instantly. It actually was directed. Rafi, the answer to your question is that we actually have that exercise with observed, but for some reason in the slides, it wasn't linked to, like by clicking on the observed, I wasn't getting to the right table. That's all right. Instead, I was landing in this table, which might be relevant to you, but this is just fine, final thing. So 
depending on how versed you are in the in the this micro literature that tries to speak about monetary policy effects or and other macro effects using the granular data. So the state state of the art there is to say, oh, I'm going to identify it of the firm quarter fixed effects. So basically, you fix the firm in a given point in time, and then you explore bank heterogeneity within a lender sort of heterogeneity within a given firm. And that allows you to deal with a very fundamental problem of is it supply or demand? So by fixing the borrower and in a given point in time, you're saying it's not a demand because now I fix the demand and I'm going to assume that all the lenders offer me exactly the same product, by the way. <laughs> And so, and then I can pray, compare across lenders. I didn't show you that regression, right? Because I, I was doing it within industry quarter. I was fixing an industry in a given point in time. Now you could say, well, I really want that original exercise within firm quarter. And here you have, by the way. But here is why my personal educated approach to this. I a firm that in the same quarter takes two loans, one in local currency and one in dollars, is just a weird firm. The chances that that is explained by some de unobservable demand are incredibly high. So, so rather than doing this mechanical exercise of plugging this fixed effects, we have it. We have it there on the background. And as you can see, the results are not very much affected. So this is the relevant difference here is this firm quarter fixed effect line. Uh, uh, at, at the, in the fixed effect list. So that's the sample. The other thing is that, uh, I mean, the trade-offs that you make whenever you do those things, your sample shrinks because now you have to only look at the firms who do that uh, two loans at the same time. But this, doesn't this beg the question, you know, um, if the firm is able to borrow 2% cheaper in dollars and sees that, you know, after having borrowed 2% in cheaper dollars upon payment, they actually have made a profit compared to having borrowed in Seoul, right? You know, why does any firm at all borrow in, 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 in Seoul? And in particular, a firm that is able to borrow in dollars, and we know this because these firms have borrowed in dollars, right? Why do they ever, ever borrow in local currency? Okay, that's a, that's a great question. And I think that they actually, so this is where I, I go to my to conversation with sophisticated players in emerging markets, such as private equity. So there are many firms out there, some of them are Turkish, that would say to you, I would never take a loan in dollars. And that is because that that's going to wipe me out the second this, this moves out. But but I think that this there is this... You're absolutely right in that. If I'm staring at 2% difference and based on my best... I understand that the past is very volatile and all of that, but the forecasts all say that this is this is fine, it's going to be fine. And so it's hard to resist the savings. And that's why the answer is it's cheaper, right? They're saving money. That's precisely the answer. Now, why not everybody is doing it? Well, here you have private equity firms I'm saying, saying that I, I don't know what I don't know, and it's a certain mess if I do it. But, this, but mine is a slightly different question, right? your within firm analysis is confined to firms that have borrowed in dollars. That's the only way they get into the sample. Yes. Right? I don't, yes. So, so, in, so these firms who can and do borrow in dollars, why do they also borrow in local currency? Rafid, I don't like this table. I, <laughs> I, I, oh, I'm doing this table just because exactly. I don't understand why they're doing both things exactly. And to me, that's like plugging that it solves some met weird methodological, uh, it introduces methodological cleanness while basically that's just the opposite on the firm level of selecting these firms that clearly have other motives, right? But I think that what I, my approach to this here, this, the punchline is the same roughly. Right, so that, that, that's my practical approach to this. So if you're a big okay. believer in this, there you go. Uh, this is a question. Uh -huh, so this this two percent thing, you know, is equilibrium outcome. So yes. wouldn't like some kind of competition by lenders eliminate this? I mean, I'm just trying to understand. So I think I have managed to understand so far that 
I, wait, 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 wait. I'm coming to it. You are, yes. uh, it's, it's, you cannot, if you are, if an entire economy, first of all, you need to understand how the banks operate. And this is a part why I'm coming to. I'm almost done with this 2%. Let's, let's talk about in the banks in a second. Just hold on to the shot. I'll get back okay. to it. Okay. All right. So this is just too generalized for you that Peru is not a weird country with 2%. I cannot get with this granularity in other contexts, but here I'm looking at the list of emerging markets. Uh, uh, they all Latin American countries where we understand how to collect data, we speak the language. Uh, so what can, now forget about lending rates. So lending rates now become very impossible to get, but most of the central banks have actual deposit rates out there. And so you can easily collect them by going to individual central banks. So what do we see? Now you see, List of countries. This is a period is different slightly. It's actually larger, 2001 through 2018. We see the foreign currency rate. We see the local currency rate on deposits because that's the only thing that you're going to see in the central bank rates. Then you see the difference, which is a column three, and you can already see that this is kind of big. And then you can start thinking about well, what fraction of it is UIP, and you can see that the magnitudes are starting lagging quite a bit. The differentials that you observe on one end doesn't quite match into that. Now you can look at also at like going to that point that if you think about the central bank rates, they are not in the same camp as the deposits and that is column number five. So there is something about the dynamic of deposits. Well, something is a strong preference for saving in hard currency that in this economies where you cannot take out this cheap dollars outside of the economy kind of feeds into the problem of lending and being, being ending up cheaper in dollars and as a result contributing to the dollarization of the of the credit and fx exposure on the uh, on the borrower's balance and column six that just does the thing where it says if you did your homework of let's Let's figure out what fraction of the of the differential in dollar versus local currency in deposit rates is accounted by UIP. And you used policy rates, central bank rates, as opposed to deposit rates. You're going to arrive to incredibly different conclusion. Right? So this is just a generalization. All right, let's get to what drives it. And to what drives it now, we need to understand how do the banks function, and then to understand a little bit the depositors. Okay? So let's look at the banks. So first of all, the key point here is that given it would be very attractive to gather these cheap dollars and invest them elsewhere, but banks are not don't have much flexibility in the setting of taking some out. I'm just showing you the dollar liabilities to dollar assets of how much it looks in the, uh, in the Peruvian economy and you can see the two legs of it. So, and, and this is the reason why. The reason, this is the way, by the way, there's some stuff missing on the slide, the header, <laughs> but this is the way the, uh, the capital requirements for FX exposure work in Peru that land you in that picture. And basically it's not a mechanism where you prohibit it to, to, to do it, but there is a heavy, punishment for having a, an expo FX exposure. Now, FX exposure comes into flavors. It could be on the asset side or it could be on the liability side, right? So, so I guess it's the combination of the regulation. Yes. And the depositor preferences together driving the 2%. Because, okay. Yes, okay. that is exactly it. So it's not about competition. They all gathering this at 2 at cheap deposits in a competitive setting. And then by the regulation, which is, by the way, this is a regulation that with exceptions that we raised of Mexico, Brazil, apparently Turkey, which in some periods tended to be more extreme. Most of the countries do regulate it this way that they put some astonishing capital requirement for the mismatch. And in the paper, we kind of uh, talk about other, other countries that do that. So, if on the if you borrow in solis uh, in local currency, uh, but then you lend on the dollar side, well, that's not a good idea. But that's not gonna explode the economy that quickly, and so that the requirement is two x uh, on the capital requirement. 
the opposite side is more problematic, right? Because they as a deposit sign dollars that could be runnable. And so not surprisingly, the other side very asymmetrically is even more punish, punish. But this asymmetry per se is not so relevant for anything that we do, but it just kind of makes sense. All right, as sign said, this is what it is. So if you look at the banks as a passive agent that doesn't have options of investing outside, that's another important point, by the way, is that you cannot see from these pictures, but it's just the regulatory structure of the of the uh, of the banks, where they are not allowed to take much of their capital abroad, and that's not surprising. Even if you take a country like U.S., U.S. has Community Reinvestment Act, right, which basically says to you you have to invest. Uh, chunk, the deposits that you're collecting have to be a chunk of them has to be invested locally at the county level. All right, so let's move with these banks that are rather constrained as far as what they can do with these dollars and how much mismatch they can they can carry. Let's shift to the uh, to the deposit side. So here we're looking at composition of liabilities by in dollars. Where they're coming from. And you can see that a big, a big suspect here is deposits. Again, I'm showing you domestic banks, foreign banks, not so relevant in the analysis, but is relevant in understanding what's going on in the broad economy. And uh, so you can, we're going to zoom on deposits. And we're gonna, our goal here is to show to show you, and look, I mean, this is where we kind of moved away from the 2% at this point. The 2% is established and left alone <laughs> at this point. And we showed you that the bank, kind of the way to think about that bank, and there is not much movement there, not much they can do. So it lands us in deposits. And what we want to show you a little bit is that this deposits the way that a sense of stickiness in that you can really modifies the brings the rates down uh, and they will not uh, and they will not be very sensitive uh, victoria is it is it at least quasi uh, sensible to say okay so the eventual losers in this in a sense uh, in a in a pure accounting not an economic accounting sense are the are the households or the or the depositors right who inelastically supply these dollar loans to the banks and banks therefore are able to get these at lower interest rates, um, right? Uh, but it's the regulation that forces the banks to pass this on to the firms because they can't use this, um, right, uh, otherwise. So, um, you know, banks are essentially, it's a washout. They pay lower interest rates, but also receive lower interest rates on this. But in the end, households receive, receive lower interest rates and firms pay lower interest rates. And so the eventual gain is on the firm side and the eventual loss is on the household side. Correct. That's, that's precisely Except okay. that you have to, so, so I, I, but of course they, uh, except that I would stay away from saying whether they're losers, right? This is- um, Pure to, accounting sense, not in an economic, exactly, uh, not in exactly. economic sense. Because it's priced, they are not, they are not sensitive. They just want to save in dollars. So yeah, that's, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, okay. So you know, this is the end result of some optimization problem of someone, correct? Right. So it's clearly optimal from the household's perspective that they choose to do this. Now, for, now banks, presumably, uh, they would they would fleece the firms a bit more. But the regulation forces them to not to benefit much from the fact that the households are uh, beholden to these dollar loans, yeah. so, and, and and therefore the firms end up benefiting from it. Exactly. So there, one more point on this on the slide is because you could say, okay, if I'm uh, if I'm a household and I have a strong preference for saving in dollars, and, and I'm sure as as you uh, when I was working down in Peru, we all the first thing we would do after we get our check in local currency is go on the street, change into dollars, and deposit it into our accounts. So so that that was just like a, a day to day life for us, and it was a very stable economy, by the way, in the period where. I lived there, so it just it just was part part of life. But so here you could say, well, can I save in some other forms in dollars? We uh, are in 2020. Surely they got mutual funds and whatnot. So they do, uh, but it's basically all limited. So you cannot take your savings uh, in some direct ways outside because you cannot open accounts uh, in the US, right? 
uh, and mutual funds, they are, they're, they're controlled in how much of that is channeled outside of the, of the economy, exactly for the same reason why banks are also constrained on how much is channeled outside of the economy. So options of getting an exposure in dollars are also somewhat limited, which is also placed into the fact that uh, savings are uh, uh, it's, it's savings that, that uh, in do deposits that end up playing a significant role. I don't really think that we need the model here, but here it is. <laughs> so all this does, and for some reason we got, uh, let me just explain you the idea of what you're trying to do. Imagine, I will talk about in a second about what we consider is shock. It's not going to be perfect. And, 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 uh, and hopefully the paper has so much to offer that you'll give me a discount on this one. But, uh, but I'll show you a shock in a moment. But imagine that I have some shock that's gonna affect uh, the, the bank. In fact, I'm gonna look at the reserves. So, and reserves in emerging countries are differential by the currency, right? So I want to reserve a differential reserve shock to dollars, which effectively means that if it increases, uh, I my cost, of handling these dollars just increased at the bank, right? So because say say that uh, that the uh, reserves is goes from zero to twenty, that means I used to be able to put each dollar to work. Now I only get to put eighty cents to work, but yet I have to pay for a dollar in deposits. And so the next question is, okay, well the bank has two options, right? and some combination between them too, because they can pass this cost, presumably they're already competitive and operating at everything. At, at, uh, at, it's not something that can eat into their profit. So they can pass it through to the loans. They can pass loans more expensive, or they can pass it to the deposits. They can start pricing deposits cheaper. But there is a reserve, this shock in reserves will generate an extra cost and I somehow have to allocate it. And so, all we're doing here is just pinning down the idea that if I have this bank that I just described for you in the middle that cannot carry in as much, then this, this type of a difference will have to be eaten on one side or the other. And it will end up being a function of elasticities that I have on one side versus the other, which is why if the saving in dollars is rather insensitive, it will be pushed towards it being primarily absorbed by the deposit side. That's so. This is more. It's not real model. It's just fixing an ideas and it's just kind of showing you how we think about it. Let's fix the banks. We have asset side. We have liability side. Uh, uh, and so let's think about how this works. So we need dollar and local currency. So you have rate on deposits, rate in loans. The one with a star is dollar. The one without a star is not. There are some quantities on the composition of loans and the deposits. We're gonna assume exchange rate is, is stochastic and the bank balance sheet is a one. And we have, for simplicity, let's say it's one bank in this entire economy. All right, so then you can shake it out to say, well, what is the bank's problem? And they are gathering money in loans and there is exchange rate in the middle, right? And they, uh, they're gathering money from deposits and they're investing them in loans. That's their margin. They're trying to maximize that difference. And then we can say what's the first order condition. And our all this shakes out to something very simple. There is no connection between how this thinks, between uh, how we think about differentials between dollar versus local currency on the loan side versus the other side. Now we're going to pin it to the bank that uh, that is perfectly match. And that of course, immediately gonna reconnect uh, the liabilities and the, uh, and the assets of the bank and their composition, right? That's, that's all it is. And you can see how uh, in the maximization problem on top, which was up until now very simple, we said it's, it's uh, all about getting interest rate on loans, combination between local and dollars, minus the cost of gathering these deposits. And now there is an extra constraint here because we have to have a much balance. And that can shake out to just rewriting it in terms of elasticities, which is where I believe it. 
And all for us that was relevant is that, which is to me is somewhat an intuitive idea, because if I make a bank so much, is that if it didn't exist, frankly, <laughs> right? So since those, the two parts instantly get attached, and that allows me to say how this, how the two elasticities interact. All right. So that, that's the framework in which we're thinking. And the claims that what I want to try to show you Let's look at the reserve. Let's look at something that looks like credible, somewhat of a quasi-exogenous quasi event. And let us let me show you that it primarily will go into the pricing of deposits. And that will be the this, this sense in which they're not sensitive. What do we have here? I'm showing you changes in reserve requirements over our sample period. And we're looking at differential between dollars and a reserve requirement change and the local currency requirement change. Imagine that they constantly move in, uh, in the same quantities. Then this would be like a whole bunch of zero dots. They would be all sitting on zero. Now, I'm plotting this against the expected exchange rate depreciation. Why is that relevant? Because you might say, this is my past to saying you that this, is no, this was a normal time and they, they, yet they did something crazy. And so you can see that, they, that, that there is no particular pattern here in terms of expected exchange depreciation versus change, change differential and with which you want to act on dollars versus local currency. Of interest to us are red dots. Love what are the red dots? So in 2014, at the end of 2014, so there are two dots and you can see actually the two are around 10%. And then you can see 2016, which actually adds up to that, exactly that. The two add up to the one on the bottom. So what did they do? So around in 2014, they all of a sudden the dollarization start trending up a little bit of credit. And the regulators get scared about what's going on. So they do this unprecedented measure, which is they escalate the reserve requirement differential on dollars by 20%. That was exactly the example I did use. If you go from zero to, to 20, it's like you used to be able to put $1 to work. Now you're only able to put 80 cents to work, right? So it's massive. There is not a chance that the timing of it is exogenous, right? It's a massive policy measure. So I'm not going to argue for that at all. Yeah, well, in fact, it, 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 it better not be, right? Uh, for the time yes, of the yes. <laughs> Luckily, it is not. What is, however, surprising here, and there is plenty of anecdotal evidence, is the quantity, right? So the quantity was a little bit of a, of a shock to that. And by the way, those two, they were announced at the same time. They just implement, they, by the time they, December 2014 went into effect, they just said it's a two step adjustment. And the second one, the second half of it is coming in February 2015. So you can see that this is, wasn't an unusual time, at least by expected exchange rate depreciation, but say this was crippling up. This line that goes up has a trapezoid kind of and then comes down, that's the differential in reserve requirements. So this is a marginal reserve requirement differential. And you can see that the part that we're going to be exploring is the up, the wild up, up, and then the undoing of the entire policy. Because after they did this experiment, into, by 2016, they said it's not working. And they did it in one sweep. They just they have gone with an entire 20%. And that, that is the part. So what do we see here? The other lines, the ones that are trending down, are deposits. And you can see that at different maturities, it all starts going down. And this is a deposit differential for dollars. So you can see that the dollar deposits start to how much you're making on deposits is starting to suffer. So this is just an anecdotal, like high level evidence. You can see it vividly. When they escalated this, the deposits, the, de the compensation and deposits starts to be lower. And this is kind of what we speak about who is absorbing it. We can do it a little bit more precise. So what I'm showing you here, let's split this in two legs. The one is a high cap of the differential and reserve requirements. It actually adds up to 21.5%. And the other leg of it is December 2016, where the entire 21.5% undone in one sweep. We just look at the difference in the deposit rates and loan rates, and we report it to you for these different periods. What else do we do? 
the uh, the last line reports you a share of dollar deposits and and uh, and how that changes. You can see that actually didn't have much effect, which is consistent with the fact that they undid the policy because what the policy was meant to do, it didn't actually put a dent on uh, on the on the deposit deposit uh, on the lending dollarization and so on. That. We do one Wait, extra thing. Could you help me with the, with the magnitudes? I find it difficult to understand. The reserve on dollar deposits increased from fifty to seventy percent. It's insane, right? So from the beginning, so I was giving you an example where you were starting with, you get to make $1, um, $1 goes to work. They're already living in the world where only 50 cents of the dollar is gets to work. Holy so crap. Yes. And then they say, no, it's a 70. So now you're really working with 30 cents. But so, I mean, it, it feels like a lot of the... Um, negative premium in the deposit rates ought to be explained by this, right? Uh, but, you... but, but this in itself is right. But this in itself is a product of two things. One is the fact that they're trying to fight the dollarization of lending. Yes. And two is the fact that this can be passed through to the deposits in dollars, which is my argument. So my, my, my argument is precisely that the deposit, deposit savings, uh, deposit dollar savings in deposits are very sticky. Could I ask, does the Chilean Central Bank pay interest on reserves? I don't know if Chileans do, but Peruvians do very little. Ah, yeah, yeah, Peruvians, <laughs> I uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Again, uh, so does the, the, the Peruvian central bank pay yeah. interest on reserves? It's a it's a great comment because of course the difference is sitting with central bank. Uh, in the paper, we exact we, we report the exact little calculation, but it's not significant in any way. So it's it's, it's a it's something, but it's very small. And can I follow up on Rafet's earlier question? I've been waiting until probably this moment to ask. Please. So, I mean, obviously we have all these uh, regulations because it's ex ante optimal. And in case of emerging market countries, you have these stringent regulatory conditions because of sudden stop risk, this and that. So we can argue this ex ante optimal in some ways. Um, but when you actually go and talk to firms, when you actually go and talk to banks, um, are they happy with this? I mean, this seems to be a really strict policy. and. I think, I, I mean, regulator may be able to rationalize this policy, but I mean, from the perspective of uh, involved market participants, I don't know whether they find this um, working for them. I mean, do yeah. you have any idea? Uh, look, I mean, nothing that came out voluntarily. Generally, banks are rather passive in this entire equation because they can, they're constrained mm -hmm. and understandably so, right? It's, it's kind of asking banks, are you happy with the capital requirements as in Basel? <laughs> so, so I imagine they're not, right? But they understand why it's there and they like- uh, Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm not disagreeing with you here. But, but, I mean, what I'm, what I'm asking is, okay, um, I, can see they, 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 I can see that they would be happy with um, some capital requirement that will make them healthy and all that. Yeah. Let them fight temptation to do wrong things, I understand. But this is pretty extreme, so <laughs> that's why I was asking the question. Well, I mean, it's not as extreme as Mexico and Brazil. So, so I, I look, saying I didn't hear, I didn't hear anything voluntarily. Uh, Buying is a kind of in this framework, and and, and they are fine. That's what they do. Mm -hmm. And um, I will show you something, uh, something in a second after we're done with this. Let's let's close the sensitivity of deposits. Okay, sure, sure. Dollars. Thank you. So, so, so all this is this estimate columns. So just two period estimate columns were all really about what happens to the rate on the uh, on the loans and what happens to the rate on deposits. And the point here is that there is significant adjustment on deposits, especially in this first first period, first at the first movement, right? And it was consistent with our graph. There is an additional number reported here, and that's the one that is called benchmark. Well, it's really nothing more special than saying in the world where I'm passing through this entire cost to through the deposits. So I can compute the cost that this reserve requirement implies. 
And if I decide that I'm going to pass it through to the deposits entirely, what would be the number? How much I would need to do to net out zero for the bank? And that's the number that I'm reporting. And then I can compare the coefficient to this extreme where everything goes through the deposits. And you can see that it gets quite close in magnitudes of, uh, of where it's heading. It's not exactly that, but it's, you fail to reject that it's any different. So this was my evidence on the sensitivity of deposits, and it was kind of showing you too that yes, it's very very compressed, and if if we introduce a quasi shock, the depositors gonna eat that shock largely. Now I'm in the two last tables. I'm just gonna we're gonna step back away from the narratives that I described to you of constrained banks, depositors who are insensitive to saving in dollars and that matching in, and the cheapness that you obtain in the deposits. You're kind of trying to discourage the depositors to supply this, this is this money, but and this creates this gap. And, and then with a the match bank, it pops out on the borrower side. And this is a story that we, uh, it seems like was very clear. Last two tables is just, as I said, there are other dynamics going on. And specifically here, we are talking about the borrowers. So this is a carry motive. And this goes to earlier brief interactions that Rafa and I had about why borrowers are lend, borrowing, borrowing uh, why borrowers are taking dollars, dollar loans. Now, our specific conversation was about the sphere borrowers that do two type of uh, borrowing at the same time in local currency. But let's, let's just abstract from that and just think about uh, what, what is it that the firms are saying. And of course, carrying an exposure on your balance sheet is, uh, is a risk taking, right? And so the way you normally, which is what says that they're doing carry trade, currency carry trade on their balance sheet. And so the way you normally test for that is in a cross, in a cross section and you say, those that are riskier have bigger incentive to do that and they are more likely to do it. And this is exactly what I'm showing to you. I'm saying now our dependent variable is gonna be probability of getting dollar loan as opposed to local currency. So conditional on you're getting a loan, how do you choose your currency? And here we see that, so I have only two variables that to measure the risk of the borrower. One is days past due. So it's how if they're entering into the delinquency on their loan. And the other one is internal credit rating, which is what we know about the banks. They assign the borrowers into the internal a rating that is proprietary to the way they think about creditors. And then I can do it at different horizons. And I say, let's look at the last quarter, let's have a look at the last two quarters, so let's look at the last six quarters. And you can uniformly see that how whatever measure you pick, there is this correlation with borrowers that are running higher risk are more likely to get a dollar loan, which is kind of... So there is something about, they, there is not complete misunderstanding that they are, they are, it's not a trivial choice. There is something about the, taking this cheaper loan, seemingly cheaper loan uh, that can catch up with you later. So clear evidence for the carry trade on the borrower side. This is another last thing that is kind of a fun thing to look at. So you remember how I told you, told you how the local regulator measured the exposure of the borrower and made them classify the borrowers in exposed, not exposed. So they actually used it to add a capital requirement. And so here, what we are looking, so the variables that says at the very bottom, post dollar loan exposed. Okay. So that's the one that is uh, a, so it's after the capital requirement kicks in, it's a dollar loan to an exposed borrower and it's a, a it's it's so after a capital requirement kicks in on the loans to expose borrowers that are nominated in dollars. And so what you would expect is that if the bank is already somehow differentiating across that, across these borrowers, they they would not this wouldn't have much kick basically. And it wasn't such a wild adjustment in capital requirement. They so introduce this minimum capital requirement, and what that last line shows you that is binding. So because they immediately raise the interest rates to the borrowers. If they would be internally provisioning for the fact that the borrower is exposed, it would have not had a bite. 
it's only to the degrees that internally they are already not provisioning for that, that that becomes binding because it introduces an extra cost. And so that to us also kind of points to the fact that, okay, banks are not completely off the hook here uh, because they are not just like this passive, passive a agents in the middle uh, and some uh, capital requirement might not be a bad idea because in this particular case, it's actually became bind. All right, so what did I show you here? A lot. So hopefully didn't, you didn't <laughs> get too, too lost. So let's, uh, the key takeaway is that. Firms say that, so the key question is why dollarization uh, of borrowing, why credit dollarization is so prevalent in credit, in, in emerging markets. And we, we kind of go after this general floating idea of it's cheaper. And we indeed show you very clearly that it is cheaper and it is significantly cheaper. And in Peruvian context, it's 2%. Now, the other part is saying that this 2% is actually coming from the setting of deposits of being, uh, this is where the cheapness originates. That kind of gives us a couple of lessons. One is that when we think about adjusting, exploring the UIP violation, maybe we should also look at the deposits, but it also kind of ties up this narrative of the glut for saving in deposits in, emer in dollars in emerging markets and and that that interacts with the dollarization. And overall, what, uh, what comes out of it is this push, t push uh, story as opposed to, 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 to the pool story, where it's all driven by borrowers and their carry trade on the balance sheet. But it's more, in our story, it coming out, starts with the deposits and pops out on the, on the borrower side. I'm a little bit early, but that's all I have. I'm happy to answer any questions. I have a question that would normally require a model to answer, but you know, I'm, I'm asking for your hunch. Um, this, is the, this is the policy relevance or the policy question that I can imagine on the one hand, this just being, you know, it's a positive description of a you know, frictionless world in a sense. And um, you know, it's all optimal, everybody's happy. So uh, just nothing to see here, carry on, except for great research, right? Um, uh, or that, uh, no, um, it's, you know, uh, this dollarization uh, of the deposit side is creating a dollarization of uh, non-financial firms borrowing, which is something that should alarm us. And uh, in fact, now that we are understanding that it's our regulation, that is causing this, perhaps we should do something else. Uh, but then um, households are doing whatever it is that they are doing, taking that as given, somebody is going to bear the risk of having the other liabilities, right? Mm -hmm. If you force the banks to not do this, then it has to be the firms. If it's not going to be the firms, it will have to be the banks. So, you know, um, as a regulator, uh, what would you think? That's a great question. Uh, and you are right that you cannot have, I mean, because we are, it's underpinned by the preference of the safer, savers, you, every time you go in the direction of, uh, you prohibit them to say save in dollars, that cannot be possible. I mean, that in, in an avoidably kind of uh, yeah, cuts their welfare, right? So, uh, it's a tricky question. What I think that it, I think that our, what we show is better at saying uh, what policy tools will not work. And basically, what we are saying, for example, the prevailing narrative was all about the carry trade, right? And in line with that saying, they uh, they're saying, oh, let's look at the exposure. Maybe next step, let's look look at the risk of the borrowers and let's somehow kind of put capital requirement as a function of that. But this story says it's really not, that's not the nature of the problem. The nature of the problem is on your saving side. And, and it's the other thing that we show in this particular, uh, uh, that when they try to go aggressively of trying to discourage savings in dollars, by imposing this capital uh, reserve, extra reserve, aggressive reserve requirement and bringing 
unintentionally maybe, but bringing down the, the compensation. It still doesn't do anything to the composition of deposits. So it's really, it also, I think, provides a little bit of a sense of that probably is not the way to go either, right? So yeah, I agree that it's unsatisfactory in that I don't have a solution for you uh, that is not uh, going after forcing people and say one currency or the other. <laughs> Uh, but I can tell you, don't waste much time of uh, solving it on the borrower side and thinking about uh, about that. That like it's like your primary driver is 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 the savings. I have another uh, quick question, uh, something that might be worth looking at. So in general, this dollarization is driven by um, the, the the by inflation risk, mm -hmm. right? Um, which is quantifiable. And presumably over a long time series, and you don't have to match this to the bank, uh, you know, your bank lending data. It's just looking at the dollarization of the deposits and relating it to inflation variance or perceived inflation variance or something of that sort. And being able to say, you know, this is truly an exogenous uh, behavior from the household side that, you know, these people need an inflation hedge and whenever they, they fear inflation, they're going to dollarize and look, these things have moved together. I think that would uh, be a nice uh, early figure in a paper of this sort. Yeah, I, the, the reason why we didn't go there is because actually, uh, I think last year there was a, a job market candidate from Harvard who had a model and kind of was tying those things up. And she actually had a, a cross country table uh, a, where she was showing the precisely pinning down that, that correlation between inflation experiences and propensity to save on dollars, mm -hmm. which is, which is abs you, and we, we, we cite her, but we kind of felt like we, we shouldn't be reporting the same thing, especially okay, the, fair enough. the stage of her career. <laughs> fair enough. I was going to ask the questions Rafael was going to ask, but he asked all of them so elegantly. So I, I don't know if I have anything to add, but I just wanted to, See, I mean, this is really about financial development, right? Uh, I mean, if um, um, Peru had a more, uh, it was if Peru were more financially developed, having a bunch of other securities that uh, depositors can use to offset the risk, maybe the dollarization would have been less. I think what you just told us is that under different policies, that I mean, it's quite it, the elasticity is like yeah. I, I really actually like your point. So yeah. in a way you're saying, let the capital flow out of the country. Let, let mutual funds invest wherever they want to invest as opposed to, uh, and because, so, so it, I mean, it is one of the components of this, that uh, this kind of, it's, a, it's an economy that you design so all the savings are recycled. And, and so you're right in, in, in Another dimension, and we don't say anything about paper, and I really like this point, is that if you relieve that constraint, that if it's not shoved all in the deposits, then then that will be less showing so in the bank balance sheet. Because right but, now, yeah, that's a primary mechanism of saving in dollars. That's really quick. You, can, you can see how politically that's not the most attract attractive proposition when you say, let, let's, let's money flow wherever it wants to flow. I have another question that, that kind of tacks on to uh, Sung's good one, which is if you don't want your banks to carry interest rate risk, mm -hmm. one thing you can do is to mandate this you know, matched uh, balance sheet. The other one is to allow them to borrow in you know, dollars and lend in Sol uh, and then force them to have a hedge, right? Uh, and presumably that, that interest rate hedge is not going to cost 2%. And if that's the case, the banks would prefer, you know, still fleecing the lenders, their depositors, by, you know, making off of their uh, inelastic uh, deposit supply, and then lending in all at higher interest rates, uh, and and hedging themselves through, you know, various ways. I I so that that's if I understand very well. Uh... Uh, your point, um, and I don't. It is just an empirical observation that there is not. They actually allowed to hedge it. 
uh, but it's an empirical observation that there is no, it's an ideal actually. If I can find some international agent who can hold this risk, then, um, but it's not something that is done in any significant way. And I don't, frankly, don't know the answer as to why. It probably goes back to Sung's lack of capital market deepness and yes. sophistication. Yes. Huh? yes. Super. Very good. Anything else? Not anyone else? Okay, so uh, it took years to schedule this, but it was well worth the effort. Uh, Victoria, it's, it's always a pleasure to see you, but um, the last many times I've seen you present, they were all in conferences uh, in you know, squeeze times. Oh. So um, this paper came through in all its glory. And for an audience of this site, uh, of, of this kind, I'd say, uh, you know, spot on. Thank you so very much for this. Okay. And um, it is the case that this doesn't count. Uh, you really have to be here. And, uh, you know, uh, we should go out drinking and talking about the authorization and, and things of that sort. Those are important things. So looking forward to seeing you again. And thank you so very, very much for this excellent presentation.